The issue we had earlier meant that our automatic system, which provides controllers with details of every aircraft and its route, wasn't working. Instead, to manage safety, we had to limit the number of flights we could manage. It's crazy to think that one or two letters could cause over $100 million worth of operational chaos for airlines. Well, it's 2023 and we live in a highly digitised, highly automated world where systems can be brought crumbling down by the smallest of mistakes. That's what happened on August 28th with air travel into, out of and around the United Kingdom subjected to significant disruption. This was the result of a system fault that briefly brought down the whole country's air traffic control network. The issue was fixed within a matter of hours, but given how busy the UK aviation industry is, the issue caused massive delays and cancellations that even continued throughout the week. Was this all because of an incorrect flight plan? Let's find out the details in today's video. The problems began on Monday, August 28th, coinciding with the late summer bank holiday which is traditionally one of the busiest days of the year for air travel in the UK. As Simple Flying reported at the time, a network-wide air traffic control fault occurred that day, severely limiting the number of flights that British airports could process. Indeed, data from FlightAware published shortly after the fault showed that six departures from London Heathrow Airport had already been cancelled, with another 82 delayed. Further to the north, Manchester Airport had already seen three departures cancelled and 22 delayed. But the situation would get much, much worse, as a total of 1,585 flights were cancelled on August 28th alone. Clearing the backlog, 345 flights were cancelled the next day, while Sirium data indicated that at least 60 flights were cancelled on August 30th. Several airlines such as EasyJet sent additional aircraft to select destinations with numerous stranded passengers. The budget carrier operated five repatriation flights to London Gatwick, with rescue flights operating from Palma and Faro on August 30th, Tenerife and Enfida on August 31st, and Rhodes on September 1st. At the same time, other carriers worked tirelessly to reroute stranded passengers while attempting to keep the operations afloat. This extensive disruption saw many passengers stranded and others scrambling to return home via alternative means. With the disruption being so widespread, many airlines and their customer service teams seemed to have trouble taking care of their passengers. Many were forced to sleep on floors or makeshift beds at airports or otherwise take long routes by land. As highlighted by The Independent, airlines were criticised for failing to book hotel rooms for passengers who were delayed overnight. Speaking to The Independent, an affected traveller stuck in France perfectly summarised the situation faced by many. It feels like there's been a lack of information for passengers, really. I understand that there's a lot of people affected across the continent. It feels like the weight of people affected has overloaded the system. We were told we would hear from somebody the following morning, and we still haven't heard from anyone. And frankly, we're not expecting at this stage to hear from anyone at all. I guess we'll be dealing with it once we get back to England. The day after the meltdown, on August 29th, Transport Secretary Mark Harper stated, Airlines are clear about their responsibilities to their customers, and I stand ready to provide further appropriate support from the government should the industry request it. On that same day, with the specific source of the problem still unclear, reports began to emerge that an incorrectly filed flight plan might have triggered the meltdown. Either way, the fault proved very costly. Indeed, with thousands of passengers needing to be rebooked, Willie Walsh, Director General of the International Air Transport Association, or IATA, said that recovering from the situation on the passenger and customer service side could cost airlines as much as $126 million. That's because these problems come at the expense of the airlines. In addition to the costs of rerouting passengers, the airlines must deal with an astronomical amount of refunds and expenses due to passengers for extended delays. 
Walsh shared his frustration with BBC Radio, saying, It's very unfair because the air traffic control system which was at the heart of this failure doesn't pay a single penny. But thankfully, as the week wore on, more and more passengers managed to get to where they needed to be, with almost all having reached their destination by the weekend. Just over a week after the disruption began, the provider for air traffic control services in the UK had published its preliminary report into the matter. The organization, known as NATS, derives its name from National Air Traffic Control Services, or NATCS, though this was simplified to be just NATS in 1972. According to the company, the problems did indeed begin as a result of an issue with a flight plan filed in its system. Specifically, one of its flight plan processing subsystems failed when it encountered a plan that, quote, included two identically named but separate waypoint markers outside of UK airspace. The two identical waypoints in the problem flight plan were 4,000 nautical miles or 7,408 kilometers apart. However, they shared the exact same name. This critical exception prompted not only the main subsystem but also its backup to enter a fail-safe mode, meaning that the plan could neither be accepted nor rejected by the system. This meant that a situation whereby incorrect safety-critical information was passed on to air traffic controllers was avoided. However, the fact that the system and its backup were down meant that flight plans could no longer be processed automatically. This is what led to the significant operational disruption faced by airports, airlines, and their passengers. Nats explains further that, This scenario had never been encountered before, with the system having previously processed more than 15 million flight plans over the five years it has been in service. Steps have been taken to ensure the incident cannot be repeated. Nats has presented its findings to the UK's Transport Secretary in the form of a preliminary report. Following the publication of this report, the CAA itself has also committed to undertaking an independent review of the incident. As well as looking at the system failure itself, the corporation will also examine Nat's response to the situation. The CAA hopes that its report will, quote, set out lessons to be learned for the future for the benefit of consumers and the industry. As highlighted by NATS, all airspace around the world is divided into Flight Information Regions, or FIRs. The CAA, or Civil Aviation Authority, is the controlling authority for the UK and its FIRs, and it's NATS that provides air traffic services for them. UK airspace is divided into three FIRs, London, Scottish and Shanwick Oceanic. The London FIR covers England and Wales. The Scottish FIR covers Scotland and Northern Ireland. The Shanwick Oceanic FIR covers a region of airspace totaling 700,000 square miles over the North East Atlantic. A typical day for Nats would see around 7,000 aircraft flying in UK skies. These include leisure, commercial, cargo and military aircraft. To our UK viewers and those who recently travelled to or from the UK, were you affected by this air travel chaos? Do you think Nats should somehow fully or partially compensate airlines for what happened? Share your thoughts by leaving a comment. Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.